Well, hello everyone and welcome to another exciting webinar. I'm Gustavo Tolosa and I'm very excited to hear what our guest has to say. And um, how are you, AJ? Everything okay? I'm great. Anyway. I, just got back. I just got back into the country, eight days teaching at Rancho La Puerta in Mexico. So I'm just very nice and tan and relaxed and it's great to be here. Thank you guys all for watching. Very good. Well, go ahead and introduce our special guest or guests, I should say. Yeah, well, actually, we have a whole family because I've been trying to get this family together for years since I met them about six years ago at Vegetarian Summerfest because they're quite extraordinary in many ways. This is part two of the Mastering the Environment webinar. And last week or two weeks ago, Dr. Lyle explained to you why the environment is so critical to your success, probably paramount, tantamount, the most important thing to your success when you're trying to affect permanent dietary and lifestyle change. He gave a lot of great information, but one of the things people wrote afterwards is, well, I have kids and they won't eat this way. So I brought out the big guns. This is my dear friend, Sharon McRae from Columbia, Maryland. She is not only a food for life cooking and nutrition instructor, but she's also a certified health coach. And I sent her all the clients <laughs> that want to, to see me that have kids because I don't have kids. So I'm not an authority on having kids. And she does coach them and she helps families, entire families as a unit transition to healthier lifestyles because she was able to do that with her own children who are now pretty much young adults, almost teenagers, when they were quite young. So let's welcome Sharon and the whole McRae family. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. We're Hi. excited to well, see you, everybody. Thank you. Well, first thing we want to talk about your shirt because I love it. It says <laughs> processed food is not healthy for children and other living things. And I love it. And your children are living. They're not things, but I think it's fantastic. And I think it's amazing that, that they're all on board. And we're going to hear from each of them individually in a little bit. But first, just briefly, Sharon, if you could just tell your story. I know your story is on YouTube on my Chef AJ page. And you were kind enough to do a Facebook Live to my group when you were in town for the Plantrition Conference. But first of all, other than the fact that you have kids and you love them and your husband, why are you so passionate about healthy eating? You've never been overweight. You've never suffered from food addiction. So why is this so important to you? For me, it's mostly about health. And it started back in my teens. That my journey actually started because I was squeamish. And I started to make the connection between roast beef I was eating and cattle I was watching on TV. And I stopped eating red meat at that point. And in my 20s, I stopped eating poultry because I was a biology major in school. I was doing dissections, started dissecting the chicken and turkey on my plate, and that went away. And then in my 30s, Dave and I had decided to start a family. By the way, this is Dave, my husband. And um, we decided to start a family. I was concerned about mercury and other toxicity, and so I stopped eating fish and seafood. So I was vegetarian from then on. And in my 40s, my mom, who had been battling breast cancer, for 26 years passed away. She succumbed to metastatic breast cancer. And it was then that I decided to refine my diet a little more, didn't necessarily realize there was a strong connection between the dairy I was still consuming and cancer, but decided to do it anyway, gave it a try for two weeks, felt really good knowing that my food choices were in line with you know, my squeamish feeling and I didn't have to worry about that anymore. But again, I didn't know about the connection. Our kids were raised vegetarian. They never had meat. And I think that was just mostly because I thought it was a healthier way to live, but there was a strong reliance on dairy. And our pediatrician who was vegetarian at the time thought that their diet was fine as long as they were having lots of calcium and lots of protein from the dairy. And I have to say, it wasn't necessarily a healthy vegetarian diet. There was a lot of processed food in there too. So fast forward, I lost my mom. I decided to become a health coach and someone in my journey suggested that I read the book, The China Study by T. Colin Campbell. And I read the book and it talked all about how casein, which was the predominant protein in dairy, was a very powerful cancer promoter. And I literally flipped out. I think I called Dave at work and I said, we can't feed the kids dairy anymore. I don't, you know, at the time the twins were uh, 10 and Evan was six. And they, like I said, they all love their cheese. They love their pizza, their macaroni and cheese, their grilled cheese sandwiches for some of their favorite foods. But I literally sat them down and I said to them, 
I am not giving you dairy anymore. There's no more cheese, no more yogurt, no more milk, no more eggs. And they started to cry hysterically. They were scared. They didn't understand what they were going to eat. I said, look, we just lost grandma due to cancer. And I forgot to mention that I have a very, very strong family history of cancer because my dad is a kidney cancer survivor. And my two grandmothers each died of different forms of cancer in their early 60s. My father's brother died of cancer and my mother's brother is currently battling cancer. So very strong family history. And of course, reading this connection in, in the China study made me realize dairy was a big culprit in everyone's diet. And so, um, you know, I basically said to the kids, look, I promise you, I will make it easy for you. And honest to God, at the time, I had no idea how that was going to happen, but I said that to them. And shortly thereafter, I met you at Summerfest, and I came to your cooking demonstration and fell in love with the food I was eating and came home with your cookbook, which I have right here. This was the book that really started our journey, Unprocessed. And I started making some of the recipes out of this book. And I started making the truffles, the raw brownies, with uh, dates and nuts and cocoa powder, and they loved everything. And then I started making some of the savory dishes like easy cheesy peasies and the disappearing lasagna was a huge favorite and the sweet potato nachos and everybody loved everything. At the time, I was not somebody who enjoyed cooking at all, by the way, but getting all of this positive feedback and seeing the kids enjoy this food that I knew was healthier for them and would protect them made me feel great. So I also, I have to say, I did buy some, even though my shirt says processed food that is not healthy, I did buy some of the diet cheese or diet cheese, however you pronounce it. And we were using that as a cheese substitute for quite a while until I read the next book, which I highly recommend for everyone, which is Disease Proof Your Child by Dr. Joel Furman. And when I read this book, what I learned was that in the first 10 years of life, when kids are rapidly growing, their genetic material, their DNA is exposed and is more susceptible to the things that cause the mutations that lead to cancer and other diseases in later life. So I realized that the processed foods full of oil and artificial flavors and colors and preservatives that I was feeding them was not healthy either. So I silently this time, I didn't tell them we're gonna stop buying it, I just stopped buying it. And they would go into the fridge because at that time they had initially not liked the fake cheese, if you will, but they started to like it so much that they would go into the fridge, remember this? And they would they would grab the shreds out of the bag and just eat the shreds plain, right? Am I lying about this? Okay, so um, so I just it just disappeared. And one day they went into the fridge and said, where's the cheese? And I said, it, we're not buying that anymore. And at that point, they just kind of threw up their hands. <laughs> they just knew that I wasn't gonna turn back. And, um, and I found a way to make their pizza. I made a pizza hummus recipe and I started making them pizza with that and nutritional yeast and they really grew to like that and so we were making cheesy sauces with cashews and nutritional yeast and those sorts of things so i found ways to still make their favorite foods that was the first step and that's kind of been how the journey evolved from from that point on yeah that's that's incredible and your, your kids were were 10 and 6 at the time when this started Yep. So, so they, they, you talked about those critical first 10 years. So I guess that the, the twins, they're, they're already screwed. So there is a chance. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding guys, because you're, you guys eat so perfectly. And you know, as extraordinary as your family is, as I travel throughout the United States, there are more McRae families in the world. I met one in Los Angeles, the Borchers. I met one in Michigan. I can't think of their names. So as I hear you talk, I know that people, if, even if they haven't typed it on the feed yet, are thinking, well, you know, good for her, but I couldn't, this is what I always hear, well, I could never do that because my kids just won't eat it. Or a lot of times the women, as you know, from our Ultimate Weight Loss Program, which you remember not for weight loss or food addiction, but as a health coach to help people, they're, they're highly agreeable people pleasers. And you're not, I mean, you're a very pleasant person, but, but you stand your ground. So like to give you an example, I had somebody come to my cooking class whose kid was in the hospital, uh, age four with cancer. She was there for weight loss and she had mentioned that the, the kid had cancer. And a lot of the hospitals, the children's hospitals are affiliated with the Ronald McDonald House. So McDonald's in the hospital. I explained to her just the first 10 years of life being built towards formation of just for kids. And she, this is what she says to me. She goes, but he likes chicken McNuggets. 
What do you say to that, Sharon, when you have a client like that? Of course he likes chicken McNuggets. He probably likes cocaine, too, if he could get it. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, if, as a parent, you, you do the best you can with the knowledge that you have. And we all, all of us parents love our kids more than life, and we want what's best for them. But once you know that something is bad for them and that could cause them disease in later life, you can't unknow it. You can't pretend it doesn't exist and go along with mainstream and just assume that your child will be okay. And so it's the same thing. If my kids enjoyed uh, marijuana and they were smoking pot in the house, and then I found out that, you know, I didn't know already that it was bad for them, I wouldn't continue to let them bring it in. You know, it, I look at it the same way. These things are toxic. And uh, are you getting ideas about that? No. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I just, you know, for me, it was non-negotiable. And I mean, you say I'm a pleasant person. My kids don't always think that because I am, I'm first and foremost, I'm their parent. And so is Dave. And we decide what's best for their health. Now, the girls are 18 now. They're old enough to make their own decisions technically. Um, but as long as they're under our roof, they still live the same way that we do. And we're very fortunate in that there's no rebellion and they really enjoy the way that we all eat. But when you are a parent to younger children, as I was when I started this journey, when they were 10 and 6, and I knew, I mean, I'm not going to say that it wasn't hard. It was very, very hard because I was taking away some of their favorite foods from them. And I just decided it, this was non-negotiable. I wasn't going to give in. I wasn't going to give back. That's not to say there was a pressure. Uh, the rest of our family was not on board and didn't support what we were doing. And I just stood my ground and said, look, this is what I've learned. And I cannot allow you to feed the kids these foods when they're over your house. And we're going to come to your home and visit you, but we're going to bring our own food for our kids. And these are the snacks they're permitted to have. And if they would go for play dates or whatever, I would call the parent in advance and say, look, this is the way we eat. Uh, as it turns out, Evan does have lactose intolerance. We didn't know it at the time, but he used to vomit all the time after eating dairy. And we never put the, we made, never made the connection as stupid as that sounds just thought he had some kind of reflux or something. And as soon as he stopped eating dairy, he stopped vomiting. So we could have used that as an excuse, but um, I would just send them with snacks. And the parents, when they would bring their kids to my house, the kids would eat things like kale smoothies and black bean brownies. And then the parents would come to pick them up. And I would say, you'll never believe this, but your son or daughter had kale and black beans today. And the kids would actually like it because they were, they were still rich. You know, they still had a lot of nuts and cocoa powder and things like that in them that aren't necessarily ultimate weight loss friendly, but that kids can definitely eat and can use those calories. So um, I, for me, it was non-negotiable. So Sharon, what I hear from some of the parents is that if they're afraid if they're too strict, the kids will rebel. So that hasn't happened in your case. How do you feel about that? You know, I, I feel that almost everything I hear is an excuse that if the parent really was doing it themselves and wanted to do it, the family would do it. But I know a lot of times we don't see spousal support and you were very lucky to have Dave support you. So perhaps you could address a little bit about how it helped to have your husband on board and what you say to maybe your clients that say, well, I'm afraid if I don't give them sugar or, or cheese, then, then they'll just rebel. You know, but they don't do that with cocaine and alcohol. You know, I don't see parents like saying, well, I better give them marijuana and cocaine and alcohol because if I don't give it to them in the house, they may rebel and get it outside the house. Right. So the one thing I left out is when I sat the kids down and told them I wasn't giving them this anymore, I explained why. Now, they were 10 and he was only six, but I still explained why. I still explained that connection in terms of disease prevention. And I think a lot of parents... Um, maybe underestimate their kid's ability to understand that I want to protect your health because I love you. So I always came at it from the perspective of love. And that being the case, uh, I also didn't make it a power struggle in that it was just non-negotiable. I didn't care how much you whined and screamed about not liking the diet cheese. This was the cheese that was going to be in the house from now on. And once they saw that I put my foot down and I wasn't being necessarily strict and yelling about it. It was just, well, you know, kind of shrugging my shoulders and saying, well, this is how it is from now on, guys. So you might as well just start to eat it because if you don't, then um, there really aren't a lot of other choices, you know? And so it really, and I gave them a lot of autonomy within those choices. So in other words, if we would have make your own pizza night, so they could put their own toppings on, they could put their own, you know, seasonings on or whatever they wanted. And that gave them 
so that it wasn't as much of a control battle. They had some autonomy in the decision making. And also I would bring, you know, I'd bring out the book like um, Unprocessed and I'd say to them, what recipe do you think we should try next? And so I would get their input. So they felt like they were participating in the decision and that makes it less of a power struggle. Now, I was very, very fortunate in that Dave was extremely supportive. He was not on board, however, and he agreed to eat the way that we did at home. But when he was out, he would eat the way he wanted to. And sometimes, sometimes <laughs> um, I would find salmon packets in the back of his car, but he doesn't like <laughs> me to talk about that. Yeah. Anyway, um, that was until he saw the movie Forks Over Knives and then he was totally on board too. But the other thing that I did with the kids that I think was really helpful is I started taking them to festivals like Vegetarian Summer Fest and the Baltimore Veg Fest and the DC Veg Fest. And we started going to meetups at other people's homes where they would have potlucks and other children would be there. And so they saw that they were not alone on this journey. And I think that really helped them to feel less like they needed to rebel or they wanted to rebel. They were more, they did fit in, but not necessarily with their direct peers all the time. Great. Gina says that you're an amazing role model for families and I think for women too. Now, Carol has a question for you, Sharon, but I think I'd rather direct it to the kids. And the question is, is do your children get teased for being so slender and eating in such a healthy way? And I'd like all three of the kids to answer if you guys do get teased for being so slender and eating in a healthy way. We can start with any of the three that would like to share, Evan, Marcy, or Tess. Sure. <laughs> Okay, uh, I have I have never been teased for being slender, like ever. Um, I wasn't I wasn't very slender before I went vegan, but no one teased me for my weight, like ever. Even when I was a bit pudgy or now slender. Um, as for eating, some some friends are a bit skeptical of it. They don't understand, but they're like, they they don't tell me you gotta eat me. They don't force me to eat anything. They they just let me eat. And it's yeah. But I, 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 so, so Evan, tell it's been 10 years now. So was it, was it true at first? Like you were crying, but now are you happy that your mom kind of forced this change on you? Um, well, it's been eight years and eight I, years, actually, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I actually am happy that she did this. I'm like proud of myself for like the way that I eat, the way that I, I know that what I'm eating is healthy and I feel bad for everyone else. Yeah. Nice. And girls, um, do, do you get teased at all for your lunches or for being slender? And how was the transition for you and how is it now? Uh, well, and Evan actually is more experienced with this than yeah. we do, but we used to bring green smoothies to school and people would make people would tease us about that a little bit, but that was basically about it. Yeah, I mean, as far as like not eating, because we never ate meat, so we didn't have an attachment or like an experience, so there wasn't much to make. I guess like people didn't really know or we weren't really exposed to that much, but um, it wasn't really ever an issue, I guess. I mean, with class parties and stuff, like, yeah, you bring in food, but at the point where I was more like cognizant of it, I don't think I noticed it as much or didn't pay attention to it. And it, it's just how it is. Um, as far as the transition and stuff, I'd say that uh, having the transition food helped. And as mom said, having the, um, the other vegan kids around and going to the potlucks and stuff that helped too. Um, we also watched some really good movies. We watched Forks Over Knives. I think Vegetarian yeah. mm -hmm. showed us, and that was no, we didn't watch. Um, so. Vegetarian was the one that we watched where um, it showed like the animal violence and stuff, and that was really hard to watch. And we were all hysterical after watching that one scene that had the animal. How old were you then? Uh, we were freshmen. They were about 12 and 13. 12, 13 14. Um, yeah, and they didn't know anything about the animal side of things I mean, because they never did. had meat. So they didn't really understand yeah, until they saw that movie. Um, yeah, so I'd say right now, the hardest the hardest two things, um, Marcy and I are going to college. And so it's not we're not living on campus. We're going to be living at home, but just trying to figure out how that's going to work. And, you know, if we're going to be getting food on campus and how we can, you know, find a meal plan that'll work for us. Um, the other right. thing, is pretty hard from the perspective of someone who's really young is knowing that eating this way has kind of saved my life and saved my siblings lives and knowing that my peers are not eating that same way and just knowing that they are kind of doomed in a sense like that's kind of dark but um just knowing that the way we eat it's kind of like there are two sides of it because i'm happy that we're eating this way and that's really helping us and it's making sure that we're going to live long happy healthy lives it's but it's also because like 
everybody else around us. Yeah, you know that yeah. people don't understand and sometimes they're not willing to. And it's also not always appropriate to bring that up and say something like, hey, what you're eating is going to kill you. Um, so yeah, that's, kind of that's funny because that's what Dr. Goldhammer's son Gar did and got kicked out of school when he was very young <laughs> saying that your mother, he said, your mommy doesn't love you because she gave you a bologna sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I actually, I got into a fight with one of my friends, not really a fight, but I got into like, this debate with one of my friends one time, one of the friends who actually made fun of my smoothie a few times. And, um, it, it was my first time like actually debating with someone on something like that. And it was really hard after being exposed to so many people who do get it. Someone who just totally wasn't even willing to understand or accept or, you know, even think about what they're doing to themselves. So um, that part's pretty hard, but all in all, I think that it's um, definitely, you know, it's the norm and that's how I want my life to be and how I live. Nice. Well, I think if somebody makes fun of your green smoothie, you should just throw the green smoothie in their face. That's what I would do. So, so, so Marcy, do, do you feel like you have the need to rebel because these things were taken away from you? And now that you're going to college, are you going to go out and get some craft and eat it? <laughs> no, um, no. So you're pretty happy with the way you eat. You like the food. I mean, yep. at first it was hard, but yeah, I, I've been to your house. So I, I mean, your kids eat health. Your kids eat as healthy as you. I mean, they do eat some of the richer foods because they they are slender and growing. But they eat basically the same diet that that, that I recommend: whole food, plant based, free of sugar, oil, and salt. But of course, they need the higher uh, fat plant foods. So Carolyn wants to know, but I think we'll direct this at Dave. How did you get your husband on? board to approve the diet change for kids. So Dave, how did she, did, she, did like, were you just a real pushover and just said, oh yes, dear, or or was this tough for you at first? No, it, it, it was never tough. I, uh, I've i always eaten the way Sharon did whenever we were together, whether, you know, in the days when we'd go out to restaurants, we'd, we'd share our meals. And so if she wasn't eating poultry or meat, I wouldn't eat it. And when, when she went completely vegetarian and we stopped having seafood, well, you know, not together, I stopped having seafood. And the same went for inside the house. And so when uh, when the kids were born, uh, you know, we were in agreement that it was, uh, that, that there was no reason for them to be eating meat. Uh, and so they were raised that way. And as Sharon told you, the, the whole process of learning more about the health effects, you know, she shared all this information with me as well. And, uh, and, and I was persuaded, although I wasn't reading it firsthand, I, I knew she that she's passionate about this and that she immerses herself in the information. And if she was saying this is what the science said and, and what the books, uh, you know, the China study and other books said, I, I certainly had no reason to doubt her about that. So I was uh, behind her in that regard. Um, and, uh, you know, she said I wasn't on board. I was I was on board you know, two meals out of every day and often three meals out of every day. But every once in a while, as she said, I did the one thing I was holding on to uh, circa 20, uh, 2010, 2000, early 2011 was, I thought that like many people do, that salmon is a healthy food. I mean, I, I'm, I'm as guilty as any American, I suppose, of being uh, uh, falling, falling under the sway of all the marketing campaigns that are done. And, and you know, everybody knows salmon is healthy, right? And um, <laughs> And so that's that's why I was still eating it from time to time. It, you know, I, I uh, uh, thought it was something I could sometimes snack on during a day at work. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, hey. when Sharon Sharon's right, when when the movie Forks Over Knives came out, and I kind of suddenly had the light bulb go on that salmon is just a, a, a type of meat that swims instead of walking or flying. Uh, Love it, it. All, all became clear. And uh, at that point, uh, I, there's been no turning back. I, my only regret is that we didn't do this a lot earlier. I love it. I love it. Your only regret is that you didn't do it sooner. And you have cancer in your family too, which means your kids have it on both sides. So it's even probably more important for them to eat like this. So uh, Joanne wants to know how about lunch at school. So um, Marcy, let's start with you. Do you, I mean, I know you're going to college now, but for the last eight years, did you pack your lunch? Did your mom pack your lunch? What would a typical school lunch look like for you? Um, I packed my lunch and I actually went gluten free because it helped with my skin a lot. Um, so and by the way, both you girls, your skin looks amazing. They both used to suffer terribly from acne and they look amazing now. So it's definitely working what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. Um, so what did you pack the last eight years? 
Um, I usually packed like a bag of apples with like I'd make a sandwich out of like tortillas, um, corn tortillas that my mom bought and said that it would be a better substitute for bread. Those so, are the Ezekiel sprouted yeah. grain yeah. tortillas. And or sprouted corn tortillas, sorry. Yeah. I'd have that with like greens and hummus that mom would make and it was it was really good. Mom wow. Ordered. And and <laughs> and, and Tess, what, what did what did you pack for and you packed your lunch as well? What kind of lunches did you pack for yourself? Um Marcy's gluten free, so she would have the tortillas. I'm not gluten free, so I would have the Ezekiel sprouted grain bread. I think we'd get this the low sodium mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So that, and um, I'd also pack like apple slices or oranges in the winter, um, sometimes like grapes or berries in the summer. Um, and then like mom ever made dessert or anything, we'd bring like a brownie. Or something. We, we have uh, throughout the school year, hummus constantly yeah. on hand. That's what they make. But it's different different varieties. All and kind, all kinds. one right. thing I want to point out is that initially when we started using these Ezekiel sprouted grain breads, which are great, uh, Evan would eat the, the plain low sodium. But the girls would only eat the cinnamon raisin. And that was, they would have it in, with savory, with sweet. That was the only bread they would eat. They would not eat his bread. And so then I started doing some reading about salt. And I realized that the cinnamon raisin had a little more salt in it. And I said to them, you know what? We're not going to buy the cinnamon raisin bread anymore. And they said, well, then we're not going to eat bread. And I said, okay, but this is the only bread that's coming into the house. And guess what? Now they love the, the low sodium variety. So, yeah. I was going to say that underscores a point I was going to say earlier. You were talking about how do you get your kids to transition. I, I've had people say, how do you get your kids to eat so many vegetables? And I say, simple. That's all we feed them. Right. That's right. And oh, my God, you it's incredible. And not only do they eat vegetables, but I've seen them make it. I, I've been out with Sharon when I visited her in, in Maryland and she'll call them up. I mean, even Evan, when he was younger and go put on the Instapot, do this. And they I mean, and that's a great skill that I had a client recently, 44 year old woman. She comes to me for a consult and she like with a straight face says, could you tell me how to cook a potato? I thought she was joking. I mean, your kids could make pretty much any recipe and, you know, and they have been able to. So that's another thing, you know, people aren't teaching their kids to cook, which is really important as they, as they grow up. So Evan, what do you take for lunch? Cause you're still, you're not quite out of high school yet. Um, so I, I basically take the same thing as Tess does in the winters, I guess. I, uh, I take a, a sandwich made of Ezekiel sprouted grain bread with uh, hummus and greens and an orange mm -hmm. and, and yeah the, the thing i do differently is i bring a green smoothie which uh some friends still did criticize me for they, they got used to it i don't care we well that tell just throw it on them and then said this is from chef aj and just blame <laughs> it on me because that's what that's what they need to stop so do you guys miss not drinking soda pop or not having sugary treats every day or chips i mean and should, uh, don't you guys feel deprived? Should we call Child Protective Services on this horrible <laughs> woman that won't feed you macaroni and cheese? I mean, I mean, may maybe they're being held hostage right now. We don't know. <laughs> I mean, um, a lot of the foods that you know you'd imagine, like we never got to have meat, and we never had. I I think I had soda like once and hated it. Like there were just a lot of things. <laughs> that was like, you were in the hospital oh, for yeah, the operation. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's just like a lot of stuff. When we were vegetarian, we already ate kind of like or like the healthy junk food. So we would have like the um, Annie's gummy rabbits and Annie's pasta and everything Annie's. Um, yeah. Not really healthy. But yeah, not really healthy. Yeah. Um, I will say that sometimes stuff looks appealing and like, I'll be like oh, I kind of miss this, but I'm not going to go eat it. Like, I know that's not good for me. And like, that's when it kicks in, you know, like it's I mean, it's already ingrained, so I would never do it anyway. But um it's good to have like, because we make substitute versions of things that we like. So we make our own pizza, and that's it. it tastes different, but it's like really good. It's not it's like apples and oranges kind of. Um, so that helps a lot too. But yeah, we're not deprived. People are like, oh, where do you get your protein? Where do you get this? And it's like it's already in everything we eat. We don't need to. I mean, we take supplements, but it's not. We're not starving. We're not. Um, obviously, we're all growing and healthy and. You know, he's way taller than we are. <laughs> he said it earlier. But um, uh, uh, Dan Daniel, Daniel, 
Daniel writes, they look like hostages and miserable, but he put a smiley face on it just so you know. So, but I think the fact that you not that you, as you said, vegetated your kids, you didn't just come in like a mean person and say, this is the way it is. You explained to them why it was, but you got them involved in the process, not just the process of learning why they want to eat this way by showing them films, but actually in making the food. And I think, I think that's so important that, that you, you did that. And, 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 and with Dave as well. And I think everything that we mentioned should be required viewing for everybody. You know, like we, we're here on the boards, like, oh, well, my husband won't even watch Forks Over Knives. So, you know, that that's just really sad. And I want to just give a big shout out to people like Dave McRae, like Charles Shrewsbury, like Tom Kramer, Tammy's husband, and all the other unsung heroes. Because as you learned from last week's webinar, when Dr. Lyle was pretty strong about, you know, standing up to these food bullies and throwing their food away, it's it can be done with an unsupportive husband. It can, but it's much more difficult. So we want to thank all you men out there that support us in this way of living because it and eating, it makes it so much easier when you have a harmonious family. And, you know, it's interesting because I was talking to Tammy Kramer uh, at, at today and her husband, Tom, came on the phone because we were talking about this topic. And he said, I just don't understand why a husband wouldn't support their wife in doing this, you know, because we talk about how sometimes the wife is overweight and the husband isn't. And, and we, we didn't, they, their children are gone, but he says, I just don't understand how if you love someone, why you wouldn't do this. So anyway, thank you so much. Oh, we have a great question for Joanne. How about when you go on vacation? I know the answer to that, but I'll let you guys say, I know what you bring. You bring something that I bring. Yes. Before I answer that though, I do want to make one point. It's not always... Sure the women who are on board first. I actually have a few male clients who are the first ones in their family to get this message, maybe because of a health crisis or something they watched or learned. And it can be just as hard to bring the female partner on as well. So there, you know, it, it works both ways. And, um, and it definitely helps if you share the information like I did with Dave that you're learning, maybe get them to watch the same movies and read the same books that you're reading if they're open to it. It really helps. Anyway, back to vacation. So we have a minivan and when we go on vacation, we look like the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> we literally pack up our entire kitchen and that includes our Instant Pot, which we could not live without. We actually have multiple Instant Pots. We have two in the kitchen at all times and three downstairs. Some are used for my cooking classes, but there's often times when we have three Instant Pots going at once. Um, and we definitely take an Instant Pot with us even on plane trips. We take our salad master cookware. We have a, a um, electric skillet that we take with us now. And we have taken a food processor in the past. I don't know if we'll do that again. We take all of our utensils, we measure out. We do your trick, AJ, of uh, pre-measuring the spices for recipes that we love. So that usually includes your red lentil chili. And I have a um, Indian red lentil soup that we love and some split pea soup recipes. So we'll measure out the spices in advance and bring those and then pre-measure the beans or whatever, all of the ingredients except for the fresh ones that we can get at pretty much any supermarket. And we take those with us. And it's, I'm not gonna say it's not an ordeal, it is. It's definitely an ordeal, but it's something that we choose to do. We stay in hotels that have kitchen suites so that uh, we can cook. You know, we don't have to worry about going out to eat. And if we do go out to eat, we do it along the way. We stop at Whole Foods along the way and we have salad bars a lot. And we just make it work because it's important to us. It's our priority. You and, know, almost every yeah. whole thing here in New England. <laughs> um, it's true. So, yeah. <laughs> so I, I want you to put this in the proper uh, context too, because sometimes people go away to you know cabins in the mountains or by the beach or whatever uh, lodges, and those are uh, furnished. But uh, you know, people bring all their kitchen equipment and all of this. In our case. We're going up to see, usually the, the, the car trips that Sharon's describing are going up to see my family in New England. And, uh, and we're going to a place where they, it's a house where my parents live. And, and you know, they, they have all the things in their kitchen. But, you know, we made this decision many years ago to say it would be upsetting to us to, to have to try to conform our way of eating to theirs. So we just took control of the food issue, even though it's more inconvenient from the uh, initial packing for our travels and then pack, you know, putting stuff away when we get home, it's, it's, it's quite uh, a challenge sometimes. But what we end up having when we get there is the ability to say, look, we're here to visit the family and visit you know, the family members we don't get to see except for once or twice a year. We're not coming here to eat. Um, we are, you know, we'll take control of our own food issue. Nobody worry about food. Nobody get offended about the fact that we're bringing our food. 
Um, just leave us to our own devices for, for making our meals and you're welcome to have some if you'd like. Uh, uh, but you know, we're, we'll focus on the visit. And so that's- I, I love, uh, yeah, I, I love that you said that. I interviewed Robbie Barbero, the mindful diabetic, and he brings his food everywhere. And I love that you guys do that unabashedly, unashamedly. And you know, when you talked about that it was inconvenient, the reason it's inconvenient is because the world isn't set up for us to eat this way. So, so if, if people, took healthy eating as a priority, it wouldn't be inconvenient, number one, but as inconvenient as it may seem and as expensive as it may seem, when you have a disease like obesity or cancer or heart disease, that is far more expensive and far more inconvenient. So let's 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 work about that. So Suze has an unsung hero for her husband. That's wonderful. And Maureen says she wished she had raised her kids this way. Well, I'm sure Maureen, you did the best you could with the knowledge you had at the time. So now that you know differently, you'll do better and hopefully uh, articulate this to them. So this is a question for everyone. Tammy says, I have fairly young kids. What is your favorite dessert that your mom makes? And we can just go down the line. Um, okay, so I I usually like ice creams that are, that makes actually, mom doesn't make enough desserts, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are all set to make your own desserts now. Yeah, but when, when they were first transitioning, um, like, you know, eight years ago, what, what, what were your favorites then? Because I think when you were six, Evan, I don't think you were making it quite that young. Yeah, of course. Uh, I usually liked uh, brownies. That type of stuff. Raw brownies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, those were awesome. Anything they were chocolate. usually popular. Yeah. Um, great. Great. Yeah. So, no. so Joanne says, what about your social lives? Since people socialize around food, do your kids have trouble socializing with peers when there is food? We're just hermits. We have no social life. <laughs> no, I, you guys go out. Uh, well, um, it, it's not really the food. <laughs> I mean, Marcy and I, at least, we're not super, I mean, we have friends and stuff, but we don't like go out all the time. Um, we mostly just see our friends in school and stuff. But when there is food involved, we just bring it around. And most of our friends know, like, there's not. Um, and they don't mind. Yeah, they don't really mind. Like, it's it's not like a conversation topic. It's just, oh, this is Marcy and Tess. This is how they are. Like, nobody really gives us crap for it. it it's all good. So, yeah. That's nice. Yeah. So, Elise says she just joined uh, How Do You Handle Treats at School? And Sharon did say that you bring them for them, just like as you would if you were kosher or if your kid had an allergy. And it's it's just not it's not a big deal. I want to be around that. Um, when Evan was in third grade, yeah, there was an ice cream party at school to reward them for good behavior. And I called the teacher and I said, you know, Evan doesn't eat ice cream. Is it OK if I bring in frozen banana ice cream? She said, sure, that's fine. And so I made the ice cream and I brought it up to Evan and his classmates were sitting around. They were having a make your own Sunday party and uh, they had all the toppings, you know, the whole nine yards. And so I brought Evan his ice cream and he opened it up and all of his friends crowded around and they said, what's that? And I said, it's ice cream, but it's made out of fruit. And I felt so sad because I wasn't allowed to share it with them, school policy. And so when the time came, they all made their Sundays. They sat down, Evan ate his ice cream. And it was interesting, you know, I could watch as the sugar hit their brain, we could see the behavior kind of escalate, you know, with time after they ate it. And when we got home, I said to him, Evan, how did you feel eating something different than all of your friends? And do you remember what you said? Yeah, I said that I was proud of the way that I ate because I knew that it was healthy for me. I was confident that what I was eating was going to do me well. I I wasn't going to overindulge in sugar or anything because it's just natural fruit. And I felt bad yeah. for everyone else who was eating all of this artificial dairy-laden ice cream, all these toppings, because it was just it was making them act haywire. It wasn't going to be healthy for them in the long run. And, and you, was, were, you were how old at the time? Eight or nine. Yeah, he was only eight or nine at the time and said that to me. And I just cried. I mean, I literally cried when he said that. He didn't see me cry, but I did because I knew I had done the right thing. I mean, I knew that anyway, but it was nice to hear from him that he didn't feel uncomfortable and he was happy with the way he was eating and living. Yeah. And 
It just, I think it's deplorable that schools even allow that crap at, at, at school, first of all. But, you know, you just proved, Sharon, that if you treat your children, no matter how young they are, as intelligent beings, they'll grow up to make intelligent choices. You know, I remember a story that uh, Jennifer Morano, Dr. Morano is the wife of Dr. Ellen Goldhammer, and their son, Gar, was obviously raised the same way, too. And it, it, Dr. Morano tells a story about when they were at some party and there was cupcakes like he had never had like a chocolate cupcake and as a matter of fact like he took an IQ test when he was younger and I believe he failed it because he didn't know what bread was he didn't know what ice cream was so he walks over to the cupcake and he takes it to his mom who's a doctor and says mom can I have that and instead of saying yes or no she sat him down and he said gar yeah you can have this but this would be the consequences you're going to really like it and then you're going to want to eat it all the time and you and and she really explained to him the consequences and he looked at it again and I don't know how old he was but he was under 10 he goes eh, I don't want it and so, so I think part of the problem is that the parents are so addicted to these foods. And, and um, the I think it starts from the top. And if the parents commit to eating this way, that uh, it makes it a lot easier. Setting because, an example is super yes. important. You know, if, if we didn't act excited about the food, I don't think they would have. And the other thing I wanted to share is I can remember very clearly that Halloween was coming. It was shortly after I transitioned them from unhealthy um, vegan to healthier vegan after reading Disease Proof Your Child. And I found this awesome clip on YouTube by Jamie Oliver, who was a chef out of England. And it was called, Watch Jamie Oliver Ruin Ice Cream. <laughs> and basically, Jamie Oliver brings all the, the ice cream and all the toppings for Sundays into a classroom. I think the kids were 17, so they were high school kids. And he says to the kids, okay, have at it, make your own ice cream sundae. And all the kids make ice cream sundaes. And then he says, okay, I'm gonna make my own version of an ice cream sundae. And he calls some kids up to assist him and he puts in things like feathers and hair beetles. and beetles, you know, uh, bugs. And uh, he says, I bet you're wondering why I made this sundae this way. And then he explains that these are the things that make up the ingredients in some of the things that you just ate. And you can yeah. see, the camera focuses on the kids, you can see them turn green. Well, my kids were turning green when I showed them this. And um, I stopped it at the end where he shows them how to make a real ice cream sundae with real ice cream. But um, basically they got the message that these things, the candies, et cetera, even if they were vegan, they still had kind of disgusting things like vanilla comes yeah. from you know, it's really disgusting. So, right. uh, and they, they they put in they sometimes express the anal glands of a beaver right. in, uh -huh. and that's yeah. just like I'm not eating that. You know, yeah. Yeah. they heard that, and that was it for candy. And I can remember one time we were at the grocery store with my dad, and there was a display like there always is of candy bars. And my father picked one up, and my kids went, "Grandpa, put that down. That's disgusting." So you know, you don't often I hear love it, but that was I love it. I love it. So Leslie says, so proud of all of you. This should be required viewing by every parent with obese children. Thank you for being such wonderful examples and sharing your story. I think every parent and family should watch this, whether they're you know overweight or not. Karen says, are any of you guys gluten-free? Yes, one of them is, she said, it's difficult to make gluten-free dishes. Not if you get my cookbook on process, there's a hundred over a hundred gluten-free recipes. Yeah, gluten she says, well, yeah, she, oh, oh, two hours. She says, one of my kiddos is gluten-free and very picky. And it's at the point where he eats fruits, veggies, and smoothies I make to which I add a power and seeds. Well, that sounds like he's eating pretty good, but I want to address that word picky because I've interviewed lots of plant-based doctors, including plant-based pediatricians. And they said, there's no such thing as picky. There's only not yet hungry, and that if you only give your cho kids two choices, take it or leave it, and make sure that one of the choices is healthy, and that there's always fresh cut up fruits and vegetables and cooked sweet potatoes and grains, that you're, if, if there's no other choices, your kids will eat it. How do you feel about that, Sharon? Totally agree. Nothing in our house is unhealthy, and the kids are free to eat whatever they want. Pretty much they eat all day. They're teenagers. They're rapidly growing. They eat pretty much all through the day, but I know that everything they're putting in their mouths is healthy because I don't buy anything that isn't. And I would say as far as the picky thing goes, I remember in the early days when I used to sit at the table and eat chickpeas and Evan would make fun of me and say, mom, you're eating chicks pea. And he also yeah. didn't, didn't like any nuts or seeds. Well, now those are two of his favorite foods. So just because your child rejects them once or twice or even three times doesn't mean they'll never like them. Now there, there is a flip side to that. For instance, Marcy, does not like sweet potatoes. And she, no matter if it's Japanese, Hana, any kind of sweet potato, she will not eat it. But if I make her sweet potato chocolate pudding, or I make a sweet potato dish, like the, the stew with um, lentils or whatever else in it and Moroccan spices, she loves it. 
So I'll say to her, Marcy, you can't have this because you don't like sweet potatoes. And she makes it clear that she does like them in dishes, but she just doesn't want to eat them without. So if we have a potato night or something, she'll, she might have rice or occasionally I'll buy Yukon gold potatoes, but I don't force her to eat something that she really has a strong aversion for. It doesn't mean I won't try to give it to her in a different way that she won't even know she's getting it because it's a very healthy food. But the point right. is you can find a workaround. And as far as the gluten-free issue, I'm gluten-free. I found out that gluten made me really sleepy. And so I don't cook anything with gluten in it. Tess and Evan do have the bread, but um, all the dishes I make are gluten-free. So it's pretty easy. You just use rice or quinoa as your grain, sweet, sweet potatoes, and of course, lentils and all kinds of beans and you know legumes. So we don't really find that to be a problem. Okay, so thank you. Angela says, where do you go for recipes to use for a transitioning family? And Bonnie says, some favorite kid-friendly recipes and meals. So anyone can answer that. Okay, so there's there's a couple of bl uh, blogs that are good. One is called Kid Tested Firefighter Approved. And there's another one, uh, Mitch Spinach, which I believe is run by Dr. Furman or used to be run by Dr. Furman. There's some good recipes there. The Disease Proof Your Child book does have some kid-friendly recipes. This is a really good one, Plant Powered Families by Drina Burton. Um, and she's got three daughters, I believe. And so she does a lot of kid-friendly recipes. And then the Forks Over Knives people just came out with this one, Forks Over Knives Family. And I believe China Study just came out with a, a family cookbook. But some of our favorite blogs, of course, we love still the recipes in Unprocessed. Um, Show that book again. Show that book again. <laughs> I have to Thank say, you not my personal copy that I use all the time. That one is too beaten up to show on camera because it's Thank been you. out for a long time. It's been used a lot. Um, Kathy Fisher has a fabulous oh, book, yeah. straightupfood.com. And the, the, the uh, treats in that recipe are very kid-friendly. Their favorite blueberry muffins ever came out of that recipe. And we've done different versions of them throughout the years. I have a couple of recipes on my website, not many, but a couple of recipes. And I put them there because they're all kid-approved. So speaking of your website, what is your website? And if somebody wanted to get in touch with you and have a session, because you do work with people and families individually. So tell us a little bit how to get in touch with you. So my website is well, all one word, dash staywell.com. And they can email me at Sharon at eatwell dash staywell.com. So nice. I do work with families and I work with them via phone or Skype or I have uh, office space here in Columbia, Maryland. So I'm happy to help you transition your kids. I know it's tough. I'm not going to say it's easy, but keep in mind, my kids are not superhuman. They're just regular kids. And it just comes down to educating yourself, being really clear on why you should be doing this, why you want to do this, sharing that with your partner, and then being honest with the kids and always coming from a place of love, I think is really important. Nice. Excellent. So Alfie wants to know if you or anyone in your family had the genetic test for cancer. I think she's uh, maybe referring to the Oncoblot. Uh, I, well, when my mom was going through her cancer treatment, she did have the BRCA1 testing done, the BRCA gene testing done. And we decided if she had been positive, I would have gotten tested, but she was completely negative for everything. And she was the only case of breast or ovarian cancer in our family. So I have not personally been tested. Nobody else has been tested. Um, as Dave mentioned, his mother had colon cancer. His father's currently battling leukemia and his brother had prostate cancer. So, but we feel like we're literally doing everything within our power that we know of to protect ourselves against cancer and other lifestyle diseases. And so truth be told, if we found out we did have a gene, there's nothing we would do differently at all. Mm -hmm. we'll eat really clean. Uh, I exercise a lot. Dave exercises occasionally. The kids, not so much yet. Um, but we meditate and we actually have a family meditation at least once a weekend to mitigate stress. And we stay away from hazardous chemicals. I'm, I'm, I used to be a makeup artist, so I use all safe and natural personal care products. And so, you know, we try to minimize the risks that we know are out there. And I don't worry about cancer anymore, which is a big relief and freedom, honestly. I think cancer is afraid of you, so I, I'm not worried. So I'm trying to find this question. Oh, here it is from, from Maureen. So uh, she sent it in because she knew about the webinar. And it says, 
that uh, but, 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 um, uh, her daughter decided to go whole food plant-based for her family because her seven-year-old spent four days at her home eating this way and now wants to be a vegetarian. She ran into a problem today when her preteen and teenage daughters, along with the seven-year-old, ate a huge amount of produce while snacking within two hours that she had just bought and paid over $50 for, expecting it to last for a few days. She told me that she can't afford to have her family eat this way if it's going to cost so much money. I'd like to know if Sharon or you have any recommendations to help my daughter feed her family a fortune children, fruits and vegetables, particularly snacks. Without going bankrupt, my daughter leaves the snack foods out on the table for them to grab when hungry. I suspect they're just eating because they're bored. And I know this needs to be addressed, but one step at a time, I'm glad she's heading in this direction and hope this doesn't cause steps backwards. So uh, what do you say to that? I have some thoughts on, on the financial part, but I'll let you go first because you're the one with the kids. Okay. So what I would say is, yes, teenagers can eat you out of house and home. But I don't think they're necessarily eating out of boredom because they're really rapidly growing and they need the calories. So it's fabulous that these kids are eating fruits and vegetables. I think you should be really happy about that. I know it's expensive. But the thing is, although fruits and vegetables are super healthy for them and they need to eat them, they're not filling. You know, they have such a low caloric density. And so mm -hmm. what I always do is I include some kind of starchy foods like the sweet potatoes, like the Ezekiel breads, or we have rice sometimes, wild rice, whatever type of rice. So those are foods that are more filling. And also some of the higher fat foods, like Evan makes his own nut butter all the time. If I let Tess, she would eat about 16 avocados a day, but we took avocados away because she was having such problems with acne. And Dr. McDougall had suggested that we eliminate a lot of the fat from the diet. So it does seem to have helped, even though she doesn't want to admit it. Um, but the kids can eat the higher fat foods. And so in addition to the fruits and vegetables, give them some of the starchy foods. The other thing I would say is, yes, we spend a lot on food. It's a choice for us to use and, and purchase only organic produce. Not everyone has to do that. There's something called the Dirty Dozen on ewg.org, environmentalworkinggroup.org. And so they tell you what crops are least uh, sprayed with pesticides. So those are safe to buy, not organic. And if you have a choice between not buying produce and buying produce that's conventional, I would always go for the conventional over no produce. Um, Absolutely. Also, Costco has been a tremendous saver, a money saver for us because we buy the greens in big tubs and we buy frozen berries in big bags and you can buy frozen corn and peas that way. So that's a really good thing. Um, and then farmers markets occasionally when you go to them and looking for sales in your regular supermarket. So. Is it expensive? I'm not going to lie. I mean, it would be a lot more expensive if we were buying meat and dairy. But mm -hmm. uh, if we choose to put our money into our food and we don't have really any medical expenses to speak of. And we know if we did get sick, like you said, it would cost us a heck of a lot more to take care of ourselves then. So it, it's an investment. And really, there aren't any excuses. I mean, potatoes are not that expensive. Right. Whole no. grain. Pot in bulk are not expensive. Beans, when you buy them and make them in the instant pot, super cheap. So, you know, you pay a little more for the produce if you choose to do organic and fresh, but that's okay. Yeah, that's a great answer. And I agree with you that, that that if they're eating a lot, it's because they're hungry. And instead of giving them the calorie dilute fruits and vegetables as healthy as they are, if they give them the starch, I mean, when bought in bulk, grains and beans are like 49 cents a pound. They're practically free. And you can get a 20 pound bag of potatoes. I'm seeing it at the 99 cent store. So there are ways to make this more, more, more inexpensive. So we have a couple of questions on special needs from Mary and Michelle. If you have any uh, experience transitioning children with autism or special needs? I don't have any specific, uh, one of the little boys that I was working with at one time did have a little bit of those issues, but um, it, it was it was a process and we had to take it slower with him. So we had to start substituting some of the things, you know, we got the dairy out, that was the first thing. And then we just very gradually sort of tried to move him in that, in that path. Um, but I would say the most important things to get out of the diet would be the dairy, number one. I wish I had done it differently, but, you know, I didn't know. And so I was giving my kids dairy up until they were 10 and 6. But I would get the dairy out. And, of course, processed meats you want to get out. And then maybe start to work on the processed foods slowly after that. But just, you know, take it very slowly. Try to find things that are comfort foods for them, just different versions or healthier versions of them. Right. Any advice Christina wants to know for teenage kids who are athletes and resisting transition or 
another part of that question is any advice for kids that are resisting transition? So there's sort of like two parts in that question that are good. Resisting transition is normal. We all resist transition. Change is hard. But as the parent, again, you know, when you control the household, even if the teens are old enough to go out and drive and buy their own food, you can make the rules for within the house. You know, you can't tell them what to eat on the outside if they're old enough to drive, but you make the rules for what's in the house. And so, again, if they're resistant, they'll find a way they're going to eat. They may not eat right away, but you can say to them, look, you're old enough to cook. So here are the things we have in the kitchen. Here's some recipe books. What would you like? I'll help you if you want to, but you can do this too. And eventually the kids will find something that they really love and uh, they'll, you know, get excited about it just like you did. But it is tough at the beginning. I'm not going to lie. It is hard. It's just that if you back down because it's hard, if you say, oh, this is too hard. I, they don't, they don't like me. My kids are mad at me. It's just, I couldn't do it. If you back down and they see that you back down, then forget it. You're going to start all over at square one because they're going to know if they put up a fuss long enough and they put their foot down, eventually you will give in. And so it just, it's basically just setting the standards and giving them choices within those standards and giving them some autonomy in the kitchen. You know what some parents have told me that, yeah, that's hard, but you know what's harder? It's harder watching your kids suffer and maybe die from cancer. And it's harder as a parent watching your child be so fat that they don't get asked to the prom. So, you know, choose your hard guys, you know, so be the parent, be the parent. You're not there to be their friend. That's what their friends are for. So, you know, be the parent. A movie called Fed Up that sort of shows that, that horrible time that kids have when they are overweight. And it's, it talks more about sugar, but it's worth watching. Great. Well, we're almost out of time. This has just been amazing. I could talk to each of you individually. And if you ever want to, I'd be happy to do this. But this question, I think, uh, just, just a quick answer from all of you. Bonnie wants to know, what information was the most compelling for veganism or for you know, for dad and the kids, or just, it doesn't have to be about veganism, but but it could be about health and nutrition. So I know for you, Sharon, it was probably reading the China study and finding out about the link between dairy and cancer, but let's hear from the other one, two, four McCrae's, there's five of you, uh, what information was the most compelling for them? Or if they prefer a different question is, what would they say to the people out there, whether it's the parent or the kids that that are resistant to eating this way? Uh, you know, any, any, any just last words of advice I'd like to hear from each of you, just, just, you know, 30 seconds or so. Can I offer something about this? Absolutely. This is, uh, this is something that I, I hope people will listen to. This is especially for resistant spouses or the teenagers who are resisting change. Um, I think I'm like many people that I always imagined that there were certain things about myself that were just facts about, about my personality. And that there are certain foods that I loved because that's just who I was. That was part of my identity. And you think of it, it's like you know, the Rock of Gibraltar. This is just a solid, hard fact about me. I love this kind of food. Well, you know what? It is all a figment of your imagination. It is just amazing how quickly, if you really commit to just trying, even for a period of you know 20 days or something, it's amazing how quickly your taste buds change. And you know, it, it, it ends up not being an issue of commitment or willpower. It's that you find out, you know what? I don't miss that stuff. I, 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 I've eaten a lot of you know, pizza and bacon and all this in my life. I know exactly what they taste like, but I do not miss them at all. And I, don't, that I have so many wonderful new foods that I appreciate now. I love, I have more satisfaction out of food and eating than I ever did in my entire life. And, um, and so the whole idea that it's like, well, I could never give up my fill in the blank. It's like, oh, oh, you've got no idea. <laughs> if you only yeah. try, you'd find out so quickly that it's like, oh, you very well can. And you know what? There's a lot of happiness on the other side. It's not about deprivation. It's about moving to something. And when you move to it and you find out how much you love the food, it's not willpower at all. You just say, wow, I wish I did this sooner. Right. That's a great point, Dave, because food preferences can change over time and you develop taste preferences for what you habitually eat. And there's only one taste preference inherent in human beings, and that's breast milk. So Jenny was saying it's too hard to do ultimate weight loss, sugar oil, salt free and get family to be vegan. You don't have to have kids be ultimate weight loss or SOS free, especially if they're not overweight. Just make the recipes from unprocessed. I wanted to show something because last week we talked about something and Dr. Lyle hadn't heard about it, but he thought it might be a good idea. I talked about these locked food safes. So I went out and bought one 
And this is what they look like. They're under $20. You can see I have peanut butter in here because peanut butter is crack. And here is the lock and I don't know the combination. And these are safe for the refrigerator or the cabinets. So if your family absolutely won't support you, at, at, this is what you're gonna have to do. You can also get dark ones because you can still see that this is peanut butter or you could cover it up. But here's what it looks like. So absolutely no excuses, guys. It's not a question of if you can do it, it's just a question of how bad you want it. So yeah, is Gustavo, yeah, Gustavo's the webinar wizard, you guys, because sometimes you say, well, I'm not sometimes, I heard somebody say, well, why is Gustavo on that webinar? Well, because without Gustavo, there is no webinar because we don't know how to do technology and he's the webinar wizard. So you better not be ragging on my boy here and be appreciating him because we have no idea what we're doing without Gustavo. So thank you, Gustavo, for, for doing this. Oh, thank no. all of you guys for watching. And remember, Sharon's uh, email is Sharon at eatwell-staywell.com. And her website is eatwell-staywell.com. Yes. And she helps people transition. And she's wonderful. I mean, she has wonderful testimonials on her website, the family she's helped. And thank you to all the McRae family for, for doing what you guys do. And I love what your kid said about how he eats this way because it makes him feel proud. I mean, that makes me feel just so proud to know you guys. I look forward to seeing you in California next month, or actually uh, we'll bo both share and I will be at the PCRM conference in July. So thanks you guys so much for watching part two of the Mastering the Environment webinar and uh, keep keep eating healthy. What can I tell you? So thank we you. Thank you for having us. announce part three. So, well. Yeah, part three. Ooh, what will part three be? All right, thank you so much, Sharon. Thanks for Thank praise. you, Sharon and family. Bye everybody. Really appreciate it. Good night. Bye. 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 Good night.